Britain is a free, open society that is a staunch defender of human rights around the world. Its footprint, while mixed, has been generally positive with the country a force for good. Torture is beneath it and its citizens can hold it to account like almost nowhere else. Well, that's not necessarily true, according to Ian Cobain, journalist and author of the two books, Cruel Britannia, A Secret History of Torture and History Thieves, Secrets, Lies and the Shaping of a Modern Nation. Ian, welcome to Navarra Media. Thank you. Thank Your you. first book was about the UK's use of torture historically. Your second is about the extent to which Britain remains an incredibly secretive country about both its past and its present. Um, and I see a bit of a thread there between these two books. Does your work effectively engage with the idea that the British don't really know who they are? That's the common theme of both books, that we don't, we British tend to have a slightly uh, distorted view of ourselves. We have a, we have a very rosy view of uh, what uh, empire was and what it entailed. And we, um, we see ourselves as being um, adherence to the rule of law, forever decent, um, never abusing those under our control, and being uh, an open, um, uh, an open, transparent, and mature democracy. And there's elements of truth in all of that, but, but it's not not the whole picture. It's not the whole picture at all. Um, so a few years ago, I, whilst um, uh, investigating the UK's involvement in the so-called Reddition Program after 9/11 came across references to a place called the London Cage, which was a detention centre in uh, just outside London in uh, during the Second World War. And I started looking for information about this, and there was next to nothing around. But there was, there was a little bit of information here and there. And so I started um, piecing together, looking at um, uh, old historical papers of the National Archives at Kew, and at memoirs, and published memoirs, and published memoirs, and newspaper reports, and you could piece together eventually um, this, uh, the fact that the British military, the War Office, ran an interrogation centre in Kensington, right in the heart of London, between 1940 and 1948, at which very large numbers of Germans were, were abused, uh, tortured, frankly. First of all, to extract militarily useful information. And then it was, became a war crimes investigation centre, and people who were accused of war crimes were, were sent there to be interrogated. And witnesses who were going to be giving evidence for the prosecution at uh, war crimes trials and post-war Germany were also set there to prepare them for their day in court to ensure that they'd say the right thing. And the people were actually hanged at war crimes trials and hanged there on the basis of the information that had been extracted uh, forcefully at the London cage. And that was the military's place, the MI5 had a place outside London. Um, so at, at the same time as I was investigating the UK's involvement in the, the abuse of detainees following 9-11, I was looking at what we were doing during and after the Second World War. And a number of people said to me, why don't we sort of see what happened in between and see if you can join the dots a little bit, see if there are any dots to be joined. And there were. Uh, I didn't really want to do it. So I, I just found it was be too depressing the subject, but a number of people called me into it, eventually a literary agent said, well, look, just, just write a proposal for me, just one proposal. And then um, having um, encouraged me to do that, she managed to find that there were a few publishers who want to publish. And it, eventually I realised it was a worthwhile project because what I was ended up doing was producing a book that wasn't so much about human rights abuses, it was actually about secrecy and the British culture of secrecy and the way in which um, we, we were most every colonial power resorted to uh, to torture at, at, at different times. So arguably, we probably weren't as bad as the Portuguese or the French. But what we were really good at was concealment. We became experts at concealment. So that the first book is as much about um, acts of concealment as acts of torture, if you like. Uh, do you think that the British are almost unique in the extent to which they think they're they're the good guys? I mean, it's um, it's obviously a theme you see throughout European imperialism. You see it, you know, amongst sort of contemporary narratives around uh, you know U.S. empire. But re reading the book and reading the scale of of what's happened, not just, not just the scale, but also you know the historical duration. You know, we're looking at a period of more than, in the case of secrecy, more than a hundred years. Do, do you think there's something unique about how this has played out in Britain, or do you or do you think that's unfair? No, I, I don't think it is unique. I think a lot of Americans think that they're the good guys at the moment. And, uh, and there's plenty of evidence to suggest that the United States isn't always a powerful good in, in the modern world. Um, 
the um, I think it's, it must be very difficult for the French to think of themselves as being the good guys because of the way in which their war in Algeria was fought very publicly. Uh, there's no great secret made of what, of what they were doing. I don't really know how, uh, how the Portuguese um, see themselves. But um, no, I don't think it is unique, but it's, it, 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 is a, 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 it is a phenomenon that you see all around you that people assume that empire was a wonderful civilizing mission and um, and we always conducted it. It's a myth. It's a myth. It doesn't travel very far, this myth. I mean, it, you don't have to get as far as Bengal to, to sort of to, to, to find people who, who regard it as a myth. You've only got to go as far as West Belfast before people start laughing at the idea that the British always upholding the rule of law and acting decency, decently. But uh, it, it is a pervasive myth within the, uh, amongst the British and the English, particularly, I'd say. In terms of where this starts, I mean, you highlight a really interesting couple of books, which I just, I'd never heard of this gentleman, who's a writer called William uh, LeCue, I hope I've said it correctly. Oh, yes. And he's a kind of sort of conspiratorial, um, I don't know what you would call it, speculative fiction, we'd call it today. Uh, you know, and he he's talking about potential invasions by France one minute, by Germany the next. And there was an interesting interplay between this world of fiction and actually you know, the intelligence community, again, we would call it that today, it wasn't called it back then. This idea of Britain being vulnerable to invasion, while at the same time, you know, having this far reaching global empire, you're saying that Britain isn't isn't unique in, it's not unique in thinking it's the good guys, I'd probably agree with you on that. But is, is there an element of uniqueness in thinking that it's so vulnerable when historically, we know that was the complete opposite of the, of the truth? It, it did genuinely seem to be quite, a, the empire expanded very quickly towards the end of the 19th century, and it did at times seem to be quite vulnerable. And uh, the, the Boer War, um, the, uh, the Boer Wars uh, underlined that vulnerability because, because um, this, this army was being manned by people who, by and large, were coming from um, the urban slums, and they were in poor shape. They were, they were short, they had poor teeth, they were not strong. And the, the Boers were, were absolutely appalled when they saw the, the discrepancy in height between the officers and the men of the British Army. The officers were big, tall, strong men, and the, the men were not. And um, so, hence, hence, um, uh, you know, the, the, the first Boer War ended for really quite badly for, for the British. And so, this um, there was a sense that we were. And at the same time, the United States was threatening the UK as a, as a, as a commercial capitalist power, and Germans were, um, were building a, a large navy and uh, seemed to be threatening the, um, the maritime dominance of the Royal Navy. So there was a period in the late 19th century, early 20th century, when the British began to feel vulnerable. And these invasion novels that William Le Cue and others were... were um, Erskine Childers, The Riddle of the Sands is one of them, of course. Um, invasion... Um, Invasion literature was, was a real genre at that time. There was an awful lot of invasion novels being uh, written, and they were selling. They were selling because they, they were being the authors knew that um, some of their readers liked to be scared, and um, they were selling these books, which suggested that a German invasion was just around the corner. Uh, the Q's books were being serialized by the uh, by the Daily Mail, and um, and it did lead, it did lead to uh, the establishment of a, of a, a committee. War Office to decide um, whether um, they should investigate whether there were German spies um, present around the southeast of England. And they started receiving handwritten reports, someone from William Q, oddly enough, to, 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 um, suggesting that people had been seen at Portsmouth and along the Kent coast who were, who were German spies. And that in itself led to the establishment of the Intelligence Bureau, which split within a, a year uh, to MI5 and MI6. So um, our intelligence and um, uh, domestic intelligence and security uh, uh, agencies were, um, I say domestic as opposed to the ones based in India, they, they, were, uh, they were actually initially created um, in response to a bogus threat of an invasion. And, um, and then a little while after that, um, the same uh, government introduced the 1911 Official Secrets Act, which was intended to be both a Counter espionage and counter transparency measure rolled into one. Yeah, the, the Official Secrets Act is fascinating because obviously at the same time you've got this this emergent 
um, set of social movements around civil liberties, expanding the franchise, trade unionism, etc. And it, it does feel like a decisive anti-democratic moment, uh, which we're sort of still living in the shadow of, but nobody really sees it in that in that way. Or, or was there a discussion more generally with these incipient labour-based movements with you know, the Liberal Party was still a pretty strong political uh, ideology in this country in the early 20th century. Was there a debate about what the Official Secrets Act meant for sort of a democratic country? There was very little debate in the Commons or the Lords about the Official Secrets Acts um, as they were rushed through the first one. The first one was passed in 1889. They thought the, the, they were, the problem the British government had is that the civil service, we had a permanent civil service by the way, 1830s, but traditionally the, the civil service in the UK had been a very aristocratic affair, where people uh, people were bound to their political masters through um, bonds of uh, class and, um, uh, and education, and very often family as well. From the mid 19th century onwards, the civil service expanded rapidly, and the number of documents that were being created expanded rapidly, and a, a clerical class needed to be hired to. Um, to transcribe them and create a lot of these documents. And they weren't very well paid, they were literate, but they were, they were entered the same class, you know, so the, the group mentality that meant that the civil service and the British government could rely upon um, gentlemanly traditions of reticence and reserve to ensure that secrets weren't exposed. That went, and these poorly paid clerks realized that, um, that the uh, the, the press, which is also expanding rapidly at this time, lived on disclosure. The press would very often pay them lots of money for, for a, a document if, uh, if they could take it to them. And at first, um, in order to suppress this, the government started um, prosecuting civil servants under the Larceny Act. They were prosecuted for the theft of the paper that, it was, that the document was written on. But juries and magistrates tended to be... Um, tended to, do, to think this was rather disreputable and throw it out. So they passed the first day, thoroughly passed an official secret act in um, 1889. It started life as the breach of official trust bill and then became the official secret act. And uh, it was passed so hurriedly that it wasn't really an effective counter-espionage measure. It only dealt with espionage in times of war, not in times of peace. Um, so there were various attempts made to introduce a second official secret act. And in 1911, it was successful. Section one of the 1911 Act uh, was a counter espionage measure. Section two was an incredibly draconian counter transparency measure, which criminalized the unauthorized, not only the unauthorized disclosure of any, any official information whatsoever without authority, it also criminalized the receipt of any piece of, um, of official information whatsoever. So Effectively meant that if a civil servant went home and told his or her uh, spouse how many um, paper clips they'd, offered, uh, they'd ordered for the office that day, they were committing an offence. But so too was the spouse for hearing it, unless they managed to get their fingers in there in the time. <laughs> and people were prosecuted for the unauthorised receipt of official information, including journalists. And that particular piece of legislation wasn't repealed until 1889. It, was, it, it lived with us throughout most of the 20th century. Sorry, in 1989, it was revealed. And what's a, what's a D-notice? I mean, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, firstly, perhaps you can explain that for our audience, but also, yes. what, a, how, how does it relate in, in, in terms of this broader debate between censorship within the media and uh, an increasingly uh, well, the, uh, belligerent this, sort of government around this stuff? The D-notice system was introduced around the same time as the, um, as the creation of MI5 and MI6 and the passing of the uh, 1911 Act. And the D-notice um Committee was um, a voluntary system of self censorship that British media agreed to enter into. And um, a notice would be, uh, a letter would be sent to editors saying, please don't report on X, Y, or Z. And they were expected to do so. It wasn't, it, it didn't have a statutory um, basis, but there was always the understanding that if you didn't do what you were asked to do, there was the possibility that the, the official secret type would be sitting in the background. It was always the Possibility of being prosecuted in the official secret act, um, and so, but, but you can see that some of the denotices that were issued early on were actually just instructions. You know, they, they were issued as instructions. Um, so during the Easter Rising in Dublin in 1916, editors were receiving notices saying, "You will only report what, what, what is contained in the official communiques. You won't be reporting anything else." It, it always had a bit of a problem because, of course, prior to 1921, 22, some of the, some of the um, 
some of the letters were going out to Irish newspaper editors, who then sent them to their friends in New York, who published what, what was who published explained to their readers what was being what was being expressed. <coughs> but the, the committee still the committee still exists. Um, it's not called the Dean of this committee. It's, it's going to those changes of name every every few years. Uh, and it doesn't issue notices as such. There are five, I think, standing notices, which you can find on the website. It's, there's a degree of transparency about the work. Of the <laughs> you can find the notices on the website. You can find the me minutes of the meetings at which um, journalists and defence officials meet together. And um, what will happen is an email is sent out saying, can we just draw your attention to uh, standing notice number four, which might be something like, uh, don't disclose the identity of any intelligence officers. That's a pleased that he's good. But, um, and again, it's voluntary. It's a much misunderstood system of voluntary self-censorship. But it's worth bearing in mind that always, in the background, it's the Official Secrets Act. And um, if you choose to ignore what the Denotice Committee asks you to do, which, which a lot of journalists do a lot of the time, you're not immune from prosecution. Can you give some examples of people ignoring denotices or, or uh, yeah. disregarding them? Well, yes, the day after the, um, uh, Edward Snowden's first disclosures appeared in the, uh, in the Guardian, a denotice was issued, and an awful lot of people completely ignored that. Uh, maybe it, um, it, it helps to explain the muted way in which the disclosures were followed up in some quarters. But, but we all know, whatever we were reading around that time, we all know what his disclosures were. And, uh, but the, the denotice was issued around that time, asking that... Um, asking that um, that the work that the the, the, uh, the information disclosed not be not appear elsewhere. So that's one good example. But journalists are still um, threatened with prosecution under the uh, under the uh, under the Official Secrets Act. Two, two arrested in Belfast in uh, August 2018 and um, accused. They, they were arrested. Armed police came to their homes and arrested them in front of their families and took their computers and took their families' computers and phones. Very intimidating. And um, they were accused of um, breach of the Official Secrets Act because they'd, they'd received a leaked document. It was a document describing collusion between police officers and murderers, mass murderers, in the 1990s. And uh, they were also, interestingly, accused of theft in the same way as people were being accused of breaching the Larceny Act in the mid-19th century. They were accused of the theft, not of the contents of the document, but the paper in which it was printed. Well, this, this was clearly, it wasn't going to go anywhere, but... It gave the police an opportunity to go very thoroughly through their computers and their phones, and it was to send a message to others, you know, to encourage others not to uh, not to make use of received leaked documents. It, it, it was intended as an act of intimidation. There's not much doubt about that. And you, you say in um, uh, History Thieves that MI6's documentation, which can go back more than a century, not a single page of it is effective. It's sort of internal communications. No, a single yeah. page of this is in the public domain. No disclosed anything they haven't disclosed anything since they established in was it um was it 1908 so mi6 records on the agadir crisis of, of uh, 1911 nobody's seen them no historian's seen them um i suspect that an awful lot's being destroyed and um, there was a foreign office historian who suggested it was because they didn't really keep many records i don't believe that for one moment um I suspect that someone has been destroyed, which would be unlawful because they are subject to the Public Records Act and they are supposed to preserve them. They're given a blanket uh, exemption from making them public and this rolls over every 25 years or so. But they are still subject to the Public Records Act, so they shouldn't be destroyed documents. But um, yes, MI5 released documents, GCHQ released documents, and they have done for a number of years. And there's been some very interesting and for historians, I believe, quite useful disclosure. But, um, but but not MI6. Occasionally you'll see a letter from an MI6 officer in the, in the files of another department somewhere. Mm. Um, very occasionally. But that's that's about it, really. And that's, um, that speaks of a, a sort of culture of secrecy and, uh, and retention, which is, which I think is kind of, I think that kind of is uniquely British. You know, I don't know that there's many other countries which have managed to um, build up uh, large and sophisticated archives and registries of documentation who would be that and quite that secretive. And how do you think that, how, how, sorry, I was going to say, how do you think that relates to sort of some of the arguments you talk about actually in both books, 
I mean, they're, they're both brilliant books. I think anybody who's interested in, well, my pleasure. You know, I think anybody who's remotely interested in British foreign policy and the nexus of, you know, British foreign policy and, you know, the, the, an establishment which even today sort of thinks it can act with impunity in many cases. Um, I think they should read both of them. And I think they, they they fit together. They dovetail really nicely. The fact that MI6 haven't got a single page of documentation in the public domain, how, to what extent do you think that relates to the fact that if you were to say to the average Brit, uh, British British soldiers fought alongside Japanese soldiers immediately following the Second World War in both Vietnam and Indonesia. Mo most Brits simply don't know that. Now, is that because people don't care? Or do you think there's a relationship between that culture of secrecy and a general public ignorance around these issues? Yes. The, the theme, in a sense, of the second book is that it, it's it's a simple idea, but I've not seen it expressed anywhere, anywhere before, which is something that... Official secrecy doesn't just limit our knowledge of what's going on around us today and what's being done in our name today. It must limit our knowledge of what's happened in our recent past and our recent history. And therefore, it must official secrecy must distort our understanding of our past. And indeed, it does. It distorts our understanding of um, of uh, foreign policy and uh, defence policy, without a doubt. And you've just mentioned the uh, the, the people. You mentioned the the war in India, China. Late 1945, 46, when um, when the French couldn't fight it because they couldn't get there. Well, there was a few Fiji French forces who had been stayed there throughout the war, and who uh, we rearmed uh, when on arrival in 1945. But the French couldn't get their troops there because um, they didn't have a navy because the Royal Navy sunk the French navy off the coast of North Africa in 1941. So we lifted a division of the British Indian Army out to um, out to Vietnam. Plus lots of other troops, and um, rearmed the Japanese who'd retreated to um, their, their barracks on the orders of the emperor, and told them if they didn't join us in fighting uh, the Vietnamese, Vietnamese people who, who were trying to assert their own government, and trying to establish their own government, if we didn't do that and help the French to restore their uh, colonial administration in French Indochina, that we were going to prosecute their officers as war criminals. And, um, and then some Japanese weren't happy with this at all, but, um, but that's what we did until the French were finally able to get there in uh, early 1946. And we did the same thing within the um, uh, Netherlands, uh, East, East Indies and Indonesia as it is now. But there, it was an even more bloody affair. I mean, there were large battles being fought against Indonesians. And uh, yeah, I, I think this is fascinating. I think the fact that people uh, some of these matters were reported on, they weren't well reported on. There was an awful lot going on around the world in late 1945-46 to distract the public's attention. Um, but now it's, it's, it's kind of forgotten. It's kind of forgotten. It's, um, and of course we had a secret war, an entirely secret war in, in Southern Oman between 1965 and, it's hard to say when it ended, probably about 76, arguably a little bit later than that. And that was just not reported. No, no report on that appeared anywhere in the British media until 1972. We managed to fight that for six and a half years. It was fought in complete <laughs> Remarkable. Remarkable. What other, what other sort of moments uh, do you think that the, the public aren't really aware of in the historical memory? So we, we've said a couple there. We've said Indonesia, Vietnam, Oman, you briefly mentioned. I mean, when, when you talk about in the, in the um, Cruel Britannia, in the, in the book on torture, I, I don't want to diminish it by calling it the torture book. It's obviously not a light subject. But you, you talk about you know, British involvement in, in Cyprus. I mean that's just remarkable. Again, it's just so little known. This is a this is a member state of the European Union. We we view it as a sort of high GDP liberal democracy. And in living memory, uh, we were using some some pretty nasty methods of extracting information from Cypriots, Greek Cypriots. I think it's worth uh, reminding ourselves that the British uh, retreat from empire was by and large quite an orderly and bloodless affair compared to uh, the experiences of some other European colonial powers. But it wasn't entirely bloodless. In, uh, in, in Kenya in particular, but also Cyprus and Aden, to a lesser degree in British Guiana, um, we were involved in, um, in trying to put down insurgencies. And we did so in an absolutely ruthless fashion in some occasions, with, uh, where we were treating some of our prisoners absolutely appallingly. appallingly. Um, the abuses in uh, Kenya became known, but were always officially denied. Um, there was less knowledge of what was happening in Aden 
and Cyprus, although in Aden there was an official inquiry into uh, what was going on, and uh, it was forced upon the British government by Amnesty International, whose first ever investigation into the human rights abuses was, 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 was into the, the, the conduct of the, the British in Aden. And um, yeah, they, they, were, they were nasty, bloody affairs, and, um, and, and people, people were hurt. People were very badly hurt. And do, again, do you think that's the fact we don't talk about it today? I mean, you, when I read the the sort of extent of the use of torture methods, and I think it's a really obviously they Brits used torture methods before 1945, but it it does seem to me that basically after the Second World War and as an outgrowth of empire, you have this huge apparatus which doesn't really know what to do with itself, but also know how. Um, and you you see this in particular in somewhere like Malaya, where there's a suppression of a of an uprising. And actually, like you say, it's done really effectively. You know, it's the Briggs plan and, and the use, use of Agent Orange that inspires what the Americans then do in Vietnam. The difference being the Americans didn't win that war, whereas actually Britain repressed this insurgency tremendously successfully. So to, to what extent do you think, when was there a moment when they thought, mm, this is probably quite bad, we, we probably shouldn't be doing this? Was there ever sort of like a jolting moment within the British establishment? Because obviously we've left all these countries today. There was points at which publicly we said this is bad and we shouldn't be doing it. And at the same time, privately, we're making arrangements for the abuses to continue. So um, a lot of people who, uh, who are Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland students in Northern Ireland um, are aware of the so-called fire techniques which were imposed on the so-called hood of men in the opening of internment in August 1971. The fire techniques which were um, dress positions, use of noise, uh, sleep deprivation, starvation, and uh, hudding, hudding. Um, they started being developed in 1945, but, and uh, the British started relying upon their wartime experience to f develop techniques which were intended to break down an individual's resistance and indeed break down the personality as quickly as possible while leaving as few marks as possible so that you could use them in a counterinsurgency operation, but you could also use them quite close to the front line in. Um, at times of conflict, and they were designed to be uh, cheap. You didn't need any equipment. All you needed is a couple of um, a couple of sandbags to put over people's heads, and uh, easy to train, easy to learn. Leave no marks. There were four of them initially, and the fifth one, the use of noise, was um, was added uh, in Oman in 1969, 70, and um, so in 19 uh, following their use in Northern Ireland in 1971, the Irish government started bringing proceedings against the British uh, government in the European courts accusing them of using torture. And initially the British government was convicted of torture and on appeal it was found that the techniques fell short of torture but were still cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. I don't think you get the same finding today. I think there'd be an acceptance that they were tortured. In 1972, after the Irish started this, uh, this action, Ted Heath, then Prime Minister, stood up in Parliament and said, we're, we're not using these techniques ever again. They're banned. They're completely banned from now on. At the same time, the Ministry of Defence sent a letter to the commanding officer of the British Army's Intelligence Corps saying, um, here's, the, here's the first draft which, of uh, this directive, which bans these techniques. But we're giving you a second draft, which permits you to carry on training in the use of these techniques. Oh, and by the way, the second directive will only be in draft form, it will never be published. So it could always be denied, it could be always be uh, denied and disavowed uh, both in Parliament and in dealings with the media. There's evidence, documentary evidence now available that shows that Ted Heath knew that this was happening, so we have to assume that he approved it. And, um, and it explains why in 2003, following the invasion of Iraq, we started using the five techniques again. We were hunting people and sitting next to generators and forcing them into stress position. Beat, I call the fire techniques, there was an unspoken sixth technique, which is that if you didn't assume the stress position, you got beaten. And there's video of showing uh, Iraqi detainees being subjected to the fire techniques, which you can find on YouTube today. Um, one of the people in the video is Baha Musa, who lost his life while being subject to the fire techniques. And we know that one of the things that happened in 2003 is that the British government's most senior military lawyer in Iraq, a lieutenant colonel called Nicholas Mercer, went to an interrogation center and saw men being subjected to the five techniques. And he said, look, this is completely illegal. It's illegal in international law. And the British government banned it in 1972. 
And the senior interrogator there said, no, 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 you're wrong. This is standard operating procedure. This is what we're trained to do. And the, the real tragedy is that they were both right. They were both right. It was um, completely unlawful. And it was standard operating procedure. So there hasn't really been a point at which we abandoned these abuses. What we did was kept trying to find ways of concealing them. And in addition to using torture techniques ourselves, you, you, you detail um, in quite in, you know in some incredible instances of extraordinary rendition. Can you, can you just explain? I'm sure many of our audience have heard those words. They probably have a vague understanding of what it means. Can you explain extraordinary rendition, particularly under under New Labour, and perhaps outline a few examples of the most yeah. egregious examples? It, it is quite an appalling euphemism, extraordinary rendition. We've, we've got a very uh, well established English word for it, which is kidnap. And it's an act in which um, governments kidnap individuals and fly them from one territory to another quite unlawfully without any extradition process and deportation process. And um, usually for the purpose of keeping them in unlawful arbitrary detention and, and, and abusing them to try and extract information from them. I detailed uh, in my book, published in 2012, I detailed what I knew then. But if our involvement in these abuses weren't being properly investigated by um, by the Intelligence and Security Committee, whose job it was to keep an eye on our intelligence agencies. Only in 2018, which would be a good 14 years after I started investigating our involvement in abuse, only in 2018 did the Intelligence and Security Committee finally publish a report which detailed what it had established about the UK's involvement in uh, rendition, as it called, they called it, and the mistreatment of detainees. And it was clearly far more extensive than I thought it was. We were involved in hundreds of occasions in which people were being, uh, ex having information extracted from them when they were being tortured and mistreated, or when we had good reason to believe that they were. And we were involved in a great many uh, rendition operations, including financing them, including providing the finance for rendition operations. Completely unlawful um, and demeaning, people could argue. So it, we have been very much involved in this um, for, for years, for years. This, the Intelligence Security Committee, of course, is the, is the committee which, uh, uh, which is about to be reconvened and hopefully we'll get to see the Russia report that was completed in, in October. Did it get extraordinary rendition? Did it get particularly bad under New Labour? Because, of course, those are the most sort of famous examples of it, most recently with Jack Straw, David Miliband. Absolutely. I mean, there is actually good reason to believe that the um, there's good reason to believe that it more or less came to an end following the 2010 election and the formation of the coalition government. And it's not probably just because the Liberals were trying to embarrass their Tory coalition partners into it. There's, there's no doubt that there would be a great many people, um, Conservative members of Parliament, who looked at the mess that the, 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 the new Labour predecessors had got themselves into and thought, we're not going down that road. We're not going down that route at all. There's also a great many people because through principle, the likes of David Davis, who, who, through principle, would, would, would insist that they were not going to be part of a government that was involved in human rights abuses of that sort. Um, but, but you can see there were still a few things lingering on in, in, in East Africa in which we were involved in some way, which was difficult to, difficult to establish. But by and large, our involvement in these human rights abuses came to an end for a while, for a while, but for how long? For how long is, is you know, we have to be, we have to remain vigilant. We have to remain vigilant. And um, when you see that the intelligence security, when you see a, a, a more or less a political down the street appointee who's trying to be forced on the intelligence security committee as its, as its chair, it, uh, it doesn't do much for one's confidence in uh, that committee's continuing. I mean, it's, it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened, uh, fortunately. But it doesn't do much for one's confidence in the executive's willingness to continue as to continue to avoid being involved in human rights abuses, I would suggest. So we've talked a bit about uh, Britain's record of um, torture. We've talked about this incredibly secretive nature of, of how it's administered colonial possessions. Can you speak a little bit about how this kind of um, concludes to a certain extent uh, with something called Operation Legacy uh, at the sort of at the tail end, uh, the final years of, uh, of Britain's empire? As we started withdrawing from empire, we started um, destroying sensitive documentation to prevent it falling into the hands of successor governments after uh, independence. 
So it started in um, southern India and Palestine and Ceylon. And um, in, in, uh, in Palestine, the um, observers um, correspondent noted all these poles of black smoke that started to appear above Jerusalem and realized that these were documents that were being destroyed. And in Ceylon, the colonial administrators started looking through the colonial officers files and what happens in Irish independence um, you know, 20 odd years earlier. And then they realized that all that existed in the uh, colonial office files was a record of what was told, uh, what the public was told that, that had happened to the files. And they thought, well, there's no point in, uh, in treating that as a precedent because what the public was told is almost certainly not truth. So um, as, as the process of retreat and empire continued, the, the document destruction became a lot more uh, sophisticated and colonial officials were given written instructions about what they should and shouldn't allow to uh, fall into the hands of successive governments. They should be told to either destroy or fly back to London. Anything that might embarrass Her Majesty's government, might embarrass Her Majesty's armed forces, Her Majesty's uh, police, might um, disclose sources of intelligence or which might be used unethically is the word used might be used unethically by a successor government and by that i think they mean might be used politically so uh, they were also told how to destroy documents they were told if you if you incinerate them you have to scatter the ashes so that nobody can see that an act of incineration has taken place if you dump them at sea you must do dump them as far as you possibly can from the shore and beyond coastal waters and this, this happened um, across the whole of the empire. And it went on from the late 40s to, to the early 1970s. It was a global orgy of destruction. And for a while, as it was proceeding, government officials set up two separate registries of files that have one which was going to be either destroyed or, and or flown back to London, and the second one that was going to be handed over to uh, the successor government. There'd be overlap in some of these papers. But it meant that um, on independence, Successor governments were trying to administer their territories on the basis of a very incomplete understanding of how it had been administered up until that point, which can't make for good governance. And in around about 1980, the Foreign Office asked its various missions around the world to uh, try and work out um, which uh, former colonial possessions of ours have governments that know that this has happened, and that understand that we've uh, stolen much of their, uh, their documentation. And the only two former colonies who understood that this was happened was, was Malta and Kenya. And the Kenyans have been asking for their documents back for years. And you've been asking for years for the return of some of these documents. And for years, the Foreign Office has repeatedly and dishonestly denied that it held them. In terms of the, in, in terms of the volume of documentation we, we still have, or we, we think that we still have, what kind of numbers are we, are we talking about here? What's the... Well, um, when a group of elderly Kenyans sued the British government for compensation for the abuses they'd suffered when they were incarcerated during the, um, the Mau Mau insurgency in the 1950s, um, the British government was obliged to disclose to their lawyers any documentation that they had with, which was relevant to the, the court's rules of disclosure. And they uh, signed a sworn undertaking to say that they disclosed everything they had. But well, historians who were advising the Kenyans' lawyers said, no, that's, that's not right. We, we know that there, there must be more than that. We've seen inventories of national archive of documents which, which haven't been disclosed. And eventually, the government had to admit that they held, that they had thousands of documents that were relevant to the Kenyans' case. And then they threw their hands up and said, actually, this is part of a larger holding of 8,800 colonial era documents that we've just discovered we have. And... Um, they appointed a historian to oversee the process of making these documents public. And he discovered it wasn't 8,800, it was more than 20,000 colonial era documents. But what, what he wasn't told was that these 20,000 colonial era documents was part of a larger hoard of 1.2 million files that the Foreign Office was holding at a repository about 50 miles north of London, a place called Hanslip Park. And uh, 1.2 million, and when I say a file, I mean, a file could be as... It can be as thick as a Hilary Mantel novel, you know, it could be, it could be many hundreds of pages. So and this, this um, for a long time, the Foreign Office wouldn't let me anywhere near this building. And when I, and it's surrounded by all sorts of security and barbed wire and such like, when I eventually did get in, I could see that it had been opened by a Foreign Office minister in uh, November 1992 at an opening ceremony. It was a purpose-built repository in which there were 
hoarding all of these files that they were holding quite unlawfully. The law doesn't allow them to do this. And um, th th there's a process they have to go through if they want to withhold documents. And, um, and they were holding it as a purpose-built repository. And it, there was mile after mile after mile of shelving in there. It just went on for miles and miles and miles. There was so much. And so, again, this speaks of a, 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 a deep rooted culture of secrecy and retention. They want to hold their, their information. They don't want the public. They don't want historians. They don't want journalists. They don't want, they don't want people know, to know what they know. It's remarkable. So when when with the, this sort of stash of 1.2 million documents, you're saying that this purpose obviously they pre their existence precedes this purpose built, built building. When, when was the who was the first person to know of the existence of these documents in this building? Well, the Foreign Office always knew. The Foreign Office always knew. But pu publicly, I mean, in terms of you know, was, what, I discovered it. I I learned of it from a good old fashioned tip off. Somebody, something slipped out into the public domain in, in the small print, and I mean the, the, the tiny print of a document uh, relating to the government's attempts to move from the, what we call the 30 year rule to the 20 year rule in the UK. So the historical documents are supposed to be available after 30 years. A decision was taken to reduce that to 20 years. That was obviously a process that had to be done gradually because of the limited resources. And there was something in one of these documents that made clear that this 1.2 million files have only just been put on the legal footing by the Lord Chancellor. And um, somebody said, have a look, have a look at this document. Yeah, I said, yeah, I can't see anything. Yeah, have a look, have a look at the footnotes. And I said, I can't read it, it's too small. Yeah, there's a reason why it's too small for you to read. Make sure you can see it. And it was there, and I think this was 2012 or 2013. Wow. So incredibly recent. Incredibly recent. So some of the documentation is going back to the mid-17th century. I mean, there was masses of files on the First World War, the Second World War, the relationship with the United States, the Cold War, um, uh, the, the Boer War, uh, uh, compensation payments to slave owners, um, uh, spies, Soviet spies, and MI6. And, you know, there's, 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 there's masses there, masses. A lot, of this, a lot of this can't be seen because of national security. No, it was, the Foreign Office decided they just wanted to let people see it. The, 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 all of it didn't have any connection to national security at all. It's just they didn't want people to know what they knew. They didn't want to hand over their documents. And I, a lot of it's still there. And I think the biggest problem the Foreign Office have got is that they haven't figured out a way of explaining to the public, well, actually, we're probably never going to. There's too much to disclose it all. They just Because they'd want to go through and read it all before it was transferred into the public domain. Of course. If there is anything that concerns national security or diplomatic relations. And they just don't have the staff to do it. It's, it's remarkable. It's remarkable. Another highly secretive institution is, is GCHQ. Um, the government, when did the government actually officially sort of acknowledge its existence? Uh, when the listings, the London Listings magazine, Time Out, disclosed its existence in May 1976. Time Out used to be a great source of investigative journalism. And in 1976, they published a, a two page spread. Um, called the headline The Eavesdroppers. You'll find it online. You'll find it on the internet. I think it's one of the most seminal pieces of British post war journalism in which um, the, the journalist Duncan Campbell disclosed the existence of, uh, of an intelligence agency far bigger and far better funded than either MI5 or MI6. It had been, I mean, it had been in existence during the, the Second World War at Bletchley Park. It had actually been in existence in, in, in one shape or another since the First World War, but it was only in 1976 that the British public got to learn of the existence of GCHQ. The Soviet Union knew about its existence, of course. They had a spy there since the 60s. But, um, so, um, but the British public didn't. Quite remarkable, quite remarkable. And when did the government sort of formally acknowledge its existence? Was it at around the same time or did we have to wait another couple of decades? No, um, so the intelligence agencies were put on a statutory footing, that is to say, there was rulings in the European Court in the late 80s saying that, look, you can have intelligence agencies, you can keep them secret, but you can't have them existing in some sort of uh, um, legal never-never land in which they don't really appear to exist. The British like to uh, have a policy of disavowal, that's to say they, they pretend that these agencies didn't exist. 
But as a result of these rulings in the European courts, um, the uh, first the uh, first the MI5 and then um, MI6 and GCHQ were put on a statutory footing in. I want to say 1988 and then 1994, certainly late 80s, early 90s. And at that point, there had to be an acknowledgement of, um, of the existence of the of these agencies. Because people, people knew MI6. I mean, people could see the new headquarters south of the Thames being built at a time when the efficient policy was still one of disavowal. You know, it, it was quite absurd, really. But the way in which the existence of PCHQ was kept secret until 1976 is absolutely remarkable. And GCHQ, I suppose it's got particular resonance at the moment because we've got the Huawei sort of detente between Britain, the US and, and China. But actually, Britain as part of the Five Eyes network was was a world leader in kind of intercepting uh, not digital communications, but eventually digital communications too, analog communications at the time. And that comes from Bletchley Park, as, as you say. This does seem to me, and obviously, you know, we're coming from a British culture as we, uh, we, we've internalised so much of this uh, kind of false history, false consciousness to believe that we're this incredibly open uh, culture, which we're definitely not. I don't think that's a particularly contentious point. But it does seem that the, the extent of the GCHQ operation was on a par with what you see, for instance, in the DDR. Now, I don't mean how pernicious it was or how authoritarian it was, but its sheer technical capability Yes. Was it was immense? Did did that come as a, a shock to the British public? Was it a big story in the nineteen seventies? It, it it was a big story in the nineteen seventies, and the government managed to make it bigger by prosecuting the journalists involved and putting them on trial. And uh, they were eventually um, prosecuted for, for fairly light penalties. But so the government managed to shoot themselves in the foot by drawing more attention to the existence of its uh, hitherto secret signals intelligence agencies. There'd been, um, there'd been uh, in the early 50s, there was, um, uh, there was a couple of uh, bleak reports about it in a student magazine in Oxford, and the two student journalists found themselves going to jail. Um, and a, a Daily Express reporter called Chapman Pincher managed to um, find out a little bit more about it um, in, uh, in the 1960s. So there was, it, it's, it seems that people are reminded of the existence of this enormous and powerful agency uh, every now and again, but then st seemed to kind of forget about it. So by the time Edward Snowden came along, you know, people had forgotten about um, the timeouts eavesdroppers um, work of 1976, or by and large they had. So it's as if they, uh, the, the public need to be reminded every now and again of the, of the, of the, uh, the size of this organisation. And, and you're right, it, 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 was, it was enormous. And, in the summer of 1945, between the end of the war in Europe and the end of the war in the Far East, the Joint Intelligence Committee and a body called the London Signals Board, which was running Letchley Park operations, they put their mind to think, you know, what happens after the war? What do we do? And you can see different drafts of their, um, of their correspondence at the National Archives and Kew, and the initial ambition was to capture everything. And when I say capture everything, the British wanted to capture everything, every single around the world, including the Americans. By the end of this sort of series of drafts, they decided that what we'll do is capture everything with the help of our American partners and our Commonwealth allies in Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand. And a lot of the documentation concerned with this would, would say, um, Oz, CAN, um, NZ, UK, US, eyes only. Nobody outside those governments were allowed to see it. And that was abbreviated eventually to Five Eyes. You didn't want to be having to put all those, all those initials on every, every document. So that's where Five Eyes comes from. And I guess we'll, we'll finish up on this. I just want to talk briefly about Ireland, because again, it, it, it feeds in particularly to, to, the, uh, to the book on um, torture, Cruel Britannia, uh, but also the, the secrecy stuff as well. So. I mean, I, I found this really, really remarkable reading it in the book. I, I'd seen it in passing, but obviously it wasn't so empirically clear what was going on. The British government had, or British authorities, had knowledge and some involvement with unionist death squads right up until the early 1990s. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, probably mid-1990s. Yeah, probably mid-1990s. So, um, yes, without, without a doubt, um, uh, we, 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 this uh, this idea that we were sort of a, 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 
an unwilling, <coughs> reluctant umpire trying to keep aside the part of these two warring tribes it couldn't really do it for me because we would work quite closely with paramilitaries from one um, one community. And um, yeah, we, we were, without a doubt. Um, there's uh, evidence, it's now officially acknowledged in one instance, the, the case I talked about earlier of the two of the first journalists being arrested and accused of theft and of the leaked documents and breached the Official Secrets Act. The document concerned police collusion with murderers, mass murderers from 1994. The reason why the copy that they had was so sensitive is because of naming the police officers involved, as, as well as naming the killers. Uh, none of whom have been prosecuted. And um, so, yes, it, it, I'm afraid it was happening. And, um, and there was a policy from 1980 on of using the police, not as a force that was going to detect crime, prevent crime, bring people before the courts. Continue to do that, but primarily it became an intelligence gathering uh, organization. And with the result that sometimes a paramilitary killer would find themselves not being prosecuted but recruited, recruited, put on the payroll. And sometimes they would get pay rises for killing people because that would raise the level of esteem within, in which they were held within the paramilitary organization in which they were. They get pay rises for having killed somebody. And there was one gentleman who kind of leaves this all behind, leaves the country. Um, he goes to Germany, is that correct? South Germany? Yes. Uh, and then he's kind of, he's dragged back into it by British authorities. So it, it's pretty clear that they want certain people in certain positions. Can you, can you sort of, how, how deep is this? Is, is this, is it, a, is it a case of certain authorities having autonomy from the British state and just acting in a carte blanche way, a few bad apples? Or, or is it more broadly British policy in Ireland until, until the mid Northern man, Ireland? Uh, Brian Nelson, a man from Northern Ireland who served in a Scottish regiment, uh, was, was not a very good soldier by all accounts, left, came involved with um, a, a loyalist paramilitary organisation, decided to leave that and go to Germany and work in Germany and just, just put, it, put it all behind him. And uh, military intelligence went out to Germany and persuaded him to come back. Um, and he was one of the people who organised the murder in 1989 of the Belfast lawyer called Pat Vanuken. Um, Interestingly, the, uh, the gunman, was the gunman of the driver involved in that, um, on being arrested, was recruited, recruited as a, as a special coach agent. And um, there's been three separate investigations, official investigations now into the British involvement in um, the murder of Pat Vanuken. And each one gives us a little bit more information about what was happening with Brian Nelson, how he was recruited by uh, military intelligence. The last one, I think, is a, is a remarkable uh, investigation by a man now deceased called De Silva. Um, the family of Pat Finucan are not completely satisfied by the report because it doesn't show that there was a single overarching. Uh, they're not entirely satisfied because they were promised a public inquiry, it's the main thing. Mm. But it, it showed that there wasn't one single overarching conspiracy against the life of Pat Finucan. There were actually several going on in tandem at the same time, which is even more disturbing in my point of view. Uh, there were, as uh, David Cameron put it when, he, when the report was published when he was Prime Minister, incredible levels of collusion between the uh, loyalist paramilitaries who murdered Pat Finucan, in front of shooting him dead in front of his family, uh, and, the, um, and, um, and, the, and the British state. And, um, but that's the one we know most about. But it's not the only occasion. It's not the only occasion when it happened. There were other occasions when there's enough evidence to show that there was collusion in, in Northern Ireland between um, the government, the police, the military, and murderers. So I think if our, if our audience are watching this and they're obviously, I would like to repeat what I've said previously, they should, they should read these books and they're, they're sort of going to probably look at your archive on The Guardian writing about whether it's extraordinary rendition to Gaddafi's Libya or the, the case of Pat Finucan. Uh, but then they might say, well, I want to do something about this. What's interesting, I think, with with um, more with the history thieves is you're quite pessimistic about the prospects for change in terms of a more transparent British state. Presumably, under the last Labour leader, so many things were up for grabs. It was a time of sort of political transition. Maybe you were a bit optimistic. I'm just curious as to as to what you feel the prospects are for positive change now in terms of more transparent government and perhaps what our audience can do if they would like to 
push that that cause a little bit further down the road? I, if I'm asked this question, I, t- I, I very often tend to cop out by saying, "Hey, I'm just a reporter. You know, it's up to you. It's up to the public. My mm-hmm. job is to try and find information, make sense of it, yeah, uh, put it out before the public. The public then decides. But there are practical. I mean, I, I talk to some of the people around the um, the last Labour leader and encourage them to think about um, about uh, official information and, and who, who's, whose property it should pro- properly be thought of as, as, as being. Uh, and um, what the current leader of the Labour Party will do, I don't know what his thinking is on that at all, no idea. But there, there are practical things that can be done. Because the, freedom, our, the UK's Freedom of Information Act is, is very flawed. It's one of the weaker Freedom of Information Acts around the world, in my view. But it's what we've got, and it's worth defending. And every now and again, governments come along and try and think of ways in which they can undermine it still further. It's worth people saying to their MP, we don't want you doing this. We're watching you. If we think this is important, our Freedom of Information Act is, is about making sure that historical government uh, or, or government documents are seen as being at times over our property and we have a right to them. So it's worth people telling to their MP, I take this seriously. Um, it's also worth um, people being aware of the fact that um, the Conservative government and Theresa May started trying to uh, dismantle, think of ways of dismantling the reforms of the Official Secrets Act that were introduced in 1989 and recriminalising the receipt of information in certain circumstances, not just national security information, but economic information as well. And um, I think it's worth people saying to their MPs, look, we, we know this was attempted and was thought about, and it was fought off at the point of which the Daily Mail. And the, and the Guardian and the Times all said, no, this is not on. Mm. Reza May realised that she didn't want to pick a fight with, she, you know, she didn't want to fight with, with uh, particularly with newspapers who she wanted to regard as allies. But it'll come back again. It'll come, it, they'll try it again. They'll try it again. And it's worth people being aware that this is a temptation to governments and saying to their members of parliament, whatever here, don't, don't think about doing this if you want my votes. So that's just a few small practical things that I would that I would suggest it's worth uh, thinking about. And so, um, I just I don't suppose you, your your audience needs to to be told this, but just bear in mind that the governments like to think that information which should properly be ours should be withheld from us, and, and that they'll do it they'll do this as much as much as possible. Information is power, and they'll they'll do it by whatever means they can. And um, how do you resist it? Well, I, I resist it for, uh, by, um, through journalism, but it's for others to uh, figure out how they can do it. But certainly talking to your MP and making clear that you regard the Freedom of Information Act as, as, as precious, it's, it's worth it. I think what's unique about this particular sort of area is that often in politics or activism, people say, well, to, to achieve real change, it's more than just a piece of legislation. But actually, in terms of the Official Secrets Act being reformed or, you know, freedom of information being enhanced, ideally, you know, that is just a piece of legislation. Uh, yeah. So it's something that I think in a, in a way, it's at least it's at least to conceive of achieving. It's relatively straightforward. Yes. One of the things that's happened at the moment um, uh, during the coronavirus crisis is that the information commissioner who um Oversees the um, and polices the uh, public body's adherence to the Freedom of Information Act, has said that she's not going to um, she's not going to issue penalties against um, public bodies that don't meet their um, the deadlines within the Act. Uh, I think that was kind of a, a naive thing to do because they don't face penalties anyway. But it sends a signal to them that um, that uh, that they may try and um, evade their obligations. But the the stat, the the, the act, the statutory timelines are just that. The timelines are there, the statute, they don't have the right to uh, ignore them. But it's, it's happening already. I've submitted one to uh, the Ministry of Defence a little while ago, saying, at the beginning of June, saying I want to know how much money has been paid out in total so far in, uh, in out of court settlements to Iraqi nationals who complained either of unlawful detention following the 2003 invasion and or mistreatment in British military detention. And they've they've basically determined they're not going to uh, give me the information uh, for as long as possible. Not least because they've got this really strange piece of legislation that's trying to run through at the moment, which would offer amnesties of sorts to British service personnel. Well, it's been Uh, a fantastic conversation. Thanks. um, Thanks so much. And do you have another book out anytime soon? 
I have another book out at the end of the year, published by uh, Grantor. It's in November, and it's a kind of micro history of the uh, of Northern Ireland's troubles. And if there's a if there's a common theme of the three books, the first two look at the way in which we British possibly aren't quite who we think we are, and the last one looks at the way in which during the troubles our enemy wasn't quite who we thought they were either. So, um, if there's a common theme, that's that's it. I look forward to reading it. Maybe we'll have you back on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aaron. Thanks very much, Ian. Bye. And thank you for watching The Bastani Factor right here on Navarro Media. We broadcast every Tuesday at 8pm. If you've enjoyed this interview, there's a whole other bunch of interviews just like it. We're tackling the big issues defining the 21st century. And if you don't want to miss another one, just hit the subscribe button. And if you really like what we're doing, go to navarromedia.com forward slash support. We're trying to build a new media for different politics. And the more you help us, well, the more of this we can do. Good night. Thank you.